Good morning. Surprise. I'm Jim Moore. This is Words of Encouragement program number, I've got my cheat sheet here, number 447. Yeah, so as it turned out, I did have some time this morning to go ahead and do the program. I didn't think I was going to, but I do. So uh, it's probably going to be a shorty, and I don't have all of my notes, and I didn't have time to prepare a big uh, thing for you. I made the announcement yesterday I wasn't going to be able to do it today, so that I was wrong. Amen. Isn't it, isn't it great to be wrong sometimes? It's awesome. I love it. <laughs> Anyway, love you guys. Thanks for tuning in this morning. Um, yeah, I'm going to, <clears throat> like I said, jump right into this and probably end fairly quickly. Uh, so the Lord, when I found out this morning I was going to have some time, he immediately began to speak to me on some issues uh, that needed to be talked about in the body of Christ today, needed to be brought up. Now, one of the reasons, let me just say real quick in the beginning, that we don't talk about these things is because they sound negative. They feel bad to us. They engender feelings of fear. There's been conflict and contradiction and condemnation, all kinds of stuff that has happened as a result of the many, many uh, things that the Lord had to say about uh, the end of days and uh, about the, I like to call them the transition, okay? So, we talk about the end of the world, and uh, I don't know why. I guess it's ingrained in me now, that song. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. <laughs> Somebody had a word here not that long ago. They said, it isn't the end of the world. The Lord, they say, spoke to him. It's not the end of the world, but it is the end of the world as you know it. And I think that's a really clear, if you think about that, the Lord is not going to annihilate the planet. He's not going to destroy the globe. He's not going to wipe it all out and start all over. He's basically going to redeem the world. It says that, um, that the Son of Man was received into heaven, Jesus, whom the heavens must receive until the restoration or the renewing of all things. And so what God intended to do in the first place, he has the power and the capacity to bring about. So the Genesis... Garden of Eden scenario, heaven on earth, God dwelling among us, walking with us. That, that original plan of the Lord is still in force. Man, whom God loves and, uh, and wants to bring this scenario to pass in partnership with him, has thoroughly messed that up. Oh, and by the way, if, uh, if we lose uh, contact here for a minute, I've been do having some struggles with my internet, so don't freak out. Uh, usually it just comes back on in a minute or two. I'll sit here and wait, if you will too. <clears throat> so, the Lord is able to bring to pass what he originally designed, and then some. God is amazingly capable of taking that which we mess up and redeeming it for something good. I, it's just crazy how he does that, but he's going to, okay? So when you read the passages about the end of the age, I like to call it not the end of the world, but the end of the age, because we are in this age, and this age is coming to a close. This is not the only age there's been. That's a whole nother story. There have been dispensations through time. I can't go into that. But we are right now in the age where God has said that the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth has he given to the sons of men. That means we have authority, and he will not step on our authority unless he is invited into this realm. This is why we pray. This is why we legislate to heaven from the place of the prayer room, which is also the throne of God. I know I'm saying a lot. I'm fire hydrating you this morning. So if you are coming on, I see a couple of you. Come on and say hello. All right. So the verses that talk about the end of the age are really talking about not the end of the world as so much as it is the transference of the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This is the way the Bible describes it. So we are transitioning to the kingdom of man being uh, finished, okay, because there's a purpose for us to becoming where Jesus sits on the throne instead of multiple rulers and uh, sometimes individual guys like Hitler and uh Nimrod and, you know, Nebuchadnezzar and these different rulers who wanted to rule the whole world. There have been a few of those, but mostly there's a bunch of people. I don't know why I hear these songs playing in my head. Everybody wants to rule the world. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. All right. So when we talk about the end, well, good morning, Angie. God bless you. We're not talking about God destroying the world, the planet. We're talking about God bringing it along 
this plan of redemption to bring back what man messed up back into the place where he can, good morning, where he can uh, walk with his people, where people can voluntarily choose to love him and so on and so on. So I want to say all that in the beginning so that your or our sometimes natural tendency, I mean, this is not the kind of title and the picture I use that's going to get tons of people want to look at it because our nature is to go up oh, negative. Oh, that's not good. Oh, that's bad. You know, Jim's having a bad day. <laughs> He's thinking about global destruction. You know, no, it's not. The Bible has 150 chapters that it that where is mentioned the end of day. So it's big on God's mind. And he did that for our sake, for our uh, benefit, so that we would not be surprised. We would not be blindsided. We would not be unprepared. He said, I want you to live your life so that you're like men and women who are waiting for their Lord to return from the feast. Jesus is returning. You'll stand before him. So will I. And the things that are going to happen before he comes can take you out. Okay? Sober moment. Pregnant pause. Okay? Pause for effect. The difficulties that are coming upon the world can take you out if you're not prepared for them and if you do not have a place of foundation with the Lord. So, I don't want to talk about that as much as I want to talk a little bit about how the Lord sees this thing playing out. Very difficult to do this justice on a large scale because I don't have time. And yet this is what the Lord spoke to me this morning. So we're going to start in Genesis chapter six, verse 13. Again, using my cheat sheet here. Sorry, Linda. This is her, uh, this is her little notebook that she uses to keep my out. <laughs> I was caught unprepared. Okay. Give me a break. All right. Genesis six thirteen, the Lord uh, spoke to Noah and, and this is a real thing that happened, okay? This is not a fairy tale. This actually happened on the same planet that your two feet are standing on right now. That's sobering. And the Lord <clears throat> said, the end of all flesh is at hand. Now, Peter said something very close to that, and I'll get to that scripture in a bit. But here's the point. Man had corrupted himself to such a degree that the Lord said, if I don't stop this, there'll be no flesh saved. Now, Jesus actually used that same phraseology in the New Testament. I'll get to that in a minute. It's difficult for us to conceive how the world could get so corrupted that the Lord would say, I am going to have to put an end to this or nobody will make it. Okay, that's a very sobering thing. But yet it did do that. And there's all kinds of uh, nuances about how that happened and you know, <laughs> the Bible says that the whole earth, violence filled the earth and the thoughts of mankind were only evil all the time. And again, when it says only and all and all that, there were some exceptions. Okay. Noah, it says that the flood came and eight people, literally eight people escaped that flood. Now, that's the mercy of God. Uh, when we are left to our own devices, often we corrupt ourselves and those people around us and sin is a spreading influence, but so is righteousness. So anyway, God at that point, pre-cross, pre-Jesus said, okay, we're going to have to, we're going to have to end it all. And that is a sobering time. Now, <clears throat> what happened after that was that God said, I will never do that again. Some of you in that scripture, I didn't have time or forethought to write down. You can look it up. You can find it. By the way, if you don't know how to do that, go to Google, go to DuckDuckGo, go to whatever search engine you use and just put in <clears throat> a rainbow or put, well, rainbow is probably not the thing to do. <clears throat> put in something about God saying he would never destroy the earth again. And you'll find the scripture. This is a big benefit in our world today. All right. But Jesus said, the Lord said, the Papa said, the Holy Spirit said, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to allow the earth not to be destroyed, and listen close, but to flood again. He says, I'm never going to, with a flood, flood the whole earth again. Okay. And there's, again, there's so many bunny trails I could go down about this and how it happened and, all, you know, all of that, but I don't have time. Okay. So fast forward to the, our day and age. Now that was 6,000 ish. Okay. I, I don't care about the specific time. It was uh, thousands and thousands of years ago, okay? We call those millennium. Every thousand years is a millennia. And so um, somewhere probably within that first thousand years that happened. So it may have been as much as close to six, I don't know. Anyway, so fast forward to now, how many times, hear me now, 
How many times has mankind come close to the destruction of their, their own selves or the planet? Probably not the planet. Man has not had the capacity to destroy the planet or life on the planet as much as he has had the capacity through mostly warfare and or disease to destroy himself. Okay, it's only been in the last hundred years that man has really truly had the capacity and mark it down, Don't make no mistake about it, we actually literally have the capacity to wipe out human beings completely on planet Earth. The question is, would God ever allow that? I'm going to get to that. So, Jesus said in Matthew 24, when they asked him three questions, I'm not going to go into all of them, but one of them was about the end of the age. What's it going to look like as we draw towards the end? Again, I don't like saying the end of the world because it's not the end of the world. It's the end of this age. There's a renovation that's going to happen in the planet and so on. There's a rapture that's going to happen. There's a, a return of the Lord that's going to happen. There's a lot of stuff that's going to happen, but it will mark the end and the last seven years says will be a, a, a time of trouble on the earth that has never been seen and never will be seen again. Never. So this idea of it getting extremely bad and extremely good at the same time happening is a reality. And Jesus said about those days. Now, somebody said, Jim, what do you believe? Hi, Tina. God bless you. Thanks for saying good morning. What do you believe? I believe that we are in those days. <clears throat> now, I believe that before. You know, I don't sweat that too much. I really don't. Because I know whether he comes or I go, It for my, for me, in my life, it's coming to a close. <laughs> you know, I may have 10, 20, 30 years. I don't know. It doesn't matter. He's either going to come here or I'm going to go there. I want to be ready. That's the main thing. However, it is very likely that this is the generation. In my opinion, it's just my opinion. Don't fight over it. Don't argue about it. Don't get on the internet. And now you found your new you know, uh, horse to whip, you know, your new, your new thing to, you know, argue with people about. Don't do that. But I do think what we're seeing right now is at the very least the precursor to the end, or we're already launching into maybe even that seven year, uh, ending those ending years. I don't know. Here's what I do know. Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. Nobody, not even him. He said, and he said that specifically, he said, not even the son of man himself knows that only the father. He says the father alone has kept that for his information. Now, what that insinuates is that it's not open ended. It insinuates the day and the hour insinuates that there is a day and an hour that is already predetermined. Now, let me and again, some of this is what I believe the Lord has showed me. You have a right to your own opinion. So on. But let's read what Jesus said. Matthew 24, 22. He says, except those days the final days, okay, except those days are shortened, no flesh would be saved. Now, here's again the title, no flesh or the end of all flesh. That's a Genesis a phrase. Genesis, it said that in Genesis, 2 Peter 3, I believe it's 3.10. Peter used the same phrase. Jesus uses the phrase, no flesh, okay? Now, let me quote it again, because I'm not reading out of my Bible. You can look it up. It says, except those days be shortened. What days? The days prior to his return, his sitting on a throne, the end of the rule of men on the earth, and the rule of the Son of Man. Good morning, Cheryl. A surprise. <laughs> okay. I'm going to say it again. Jesus, not... Jesus said this, okay, the Lord, the one you love, the one you serve, your king, your master, your Messiah, the one who says, I am the truth. My words will never pass away. He said this, except those days are shortened. The insinuation being the Lord shortens them. Okay, not mankind shorten it. Man can't shorten the days. Well, they can, but that's, that's, let me get to that in a minute. But it's the Lord saying, it's easy to understand. He's saying, unless I put my hand down and said, enough is enough. What would happen? No flesh would be saved. Now, a lot of people think that means no souls would be saved. <clears throat> I don't think that's what it means. So let me tell you why I believe that. There has never been a time on planet Earth, okay, never been a time on planet Earth where somebody wasn't saved. Now, not through the cross. I'm not talking about New Testament salvation. I'm not talking about the cross of Christ. I'm talking about a person being in right relationship with the Lord 
to where they are part of him and he's part of them. And if when they if they were to pass or when they pass, they would go to dwell with the Lord forever. OK, so many nuances there. You've got Abraham. Hi, David. You've got Father Abraham. You've got the um, the abode of the dead. You've got Tartarus. You've got there's just so many things that I could go into. But the idea is that there's always been somebody who was right with God. OK, so uh, Noah's time. Okay, all the way back to Noah, when the flood came, there were, Noah was found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He was right with God, okay? So this was before the Lord Jesus came, this was before the cross, but when he perished, when he finally died, he went in to be with the Lord and others as well. So what am I saying? I'm saying that when Jesus said, unless those days be short, no flesh will be saved, I, I don't believe he's saying nobody would go to heaven. He is literally talking about the destruction of human flesh. Okay. He is literally talking about mankind. Hear me now. And I know not everyone's going to agree. It's so okay. Don't freak out. Okay. He is literally saying, in my opinion, <clears throat> that unless I stop the progression of mankind on planet Earth and what they're doing to themselves, they're going to eventually destroy themselves. No flesh, unless those days, the last days, be shortened, no flesh will be saved. In other words, mankind will destroy himself. Now, historically, that's not hard to believe, okay? So, uh, you know, when we dropped the bomb, the United States of America dropped the bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, we actually dropped two bombs, okay? Two atom bombs. Some people forget that. It wasn't just one, it was two. 100,000 people died in a moment. A hundred thousand people died. And we're just like, oh my gosh, that is just, and that seems so crazy to us and so out there. And yet, when compared with some of the other uh, times that man has come close to destroying at least a large chunk of the planet, it is pales. For example, 19, let's say 1936, okay? Some of you are not, you don't know history, that's fine. Uh, just let me tell you just a little bit real quick. Just hang on for a second. 1936. Some of your parents lived then, your grandparents go, this is not a million years away or a thousand years away. It's just not that long ago, actually. So let's, um, let's say a God rose up a man or a woman in 1936. Okay, World War, World War II, around 1940, 1940 to 1944, 1945, about a four or five year expanse is all that was. Just a peer, about a four or five year period of time. It's all 1940-ish. I mean, things happened before things happened. You get what I'm saying. The primary war happened between 1940 and 1944, 45, okay? Small chunk of time. Let's say God raised up a man or woman to have a global influence. And they said within five years, a war is going to start. It will start incrementally. It'll start small. But in a very short amount of time, just a couple of years, it's going to involve the entire planet. And there will, at the end, there will be much warfare. All the nations will be involved. Well, most all the nations involved. It'll be global. And it will cost the planet, hear this now, not 100,000 people when we drop the atom, atom bomb. Not 100,000 people, okay? Nagasaki, Hiroshima, not 100,000. It'll cost 50 million people on the front end and probably another 50 million people because of the, the flu, the Spanish flu, the disease, which many people believe actually came in some way as a consequence of the war that one led into the other. Not going to go there. Roughly 100 million people. Now, again, we think of the atom bomb, 100,000 people, death, you know, instantly, you know, well, not all instantly, but you know what I'm saying? In a moment, boom, 100,000 people gone. That's the worst thing that ever happened in the world. Actually, it's not. In your parents' lifetime, they saw 50 to 100 million people, okay, perish. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying mankind has the capacity to devastate the planet. Now, okay, take a breath. Take a breath, okay? I'm trying to 
get to some really good news here in a minute. But here's the play. Hi, Elizabeth. God bless you. Jesus said, if in those days, in the last days, if I don't shorten those days, no flesh will be saved. I don't believe he's saying nobody's soul would be saved. Because I think on the planet, historically, there's always been somebody who was right with God. Always. And I think no matter how bad things got, there's always, and I know someone will disagree with me. So, okay. There's always going to be somebody who's right with God. Okay. It's never been that otherwise, and I don't think it ever will be. However, mankind does possess the capacity to destroy all flesh. Now, Will that ever happen? That's the big question. Immediately, I talk to people and, oh, well, God would never let that happen. Well, he did let World War II happen. 50 to 100 million people. He did let that happen. Okay, But it wasn't him. It was us that did that. Okay, so actually, you're right in the sense that the Lord said, no, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to. And as a matter of fact, when he said that about in Genesis about the flood, he says, I'm never going to flood the earth again. Okay. There will come a time when the earth will be renovated by fire. That's another subject. That's going to happen way far in the future. But for now, we're, the day we're living in, mankind not only possesses the capacity to destroy itself, okay, it would eventually destroy itself. I was reading in uh, the book, The Final Quest. You've heard me reference that many times. I, I strongly encourage anybody to read that. It's, I think, one of the best books I've ever read. One of the things, it's a compilation of... Uh, of uh, encounters with the Lord. I mean, like face-to-face -face encounters with the Lord and, and saints in heaven and so on and so on. <clears throat> but he says, the Lord, I believe it was said to him that there, that the time is approaching when man mankind will no longer be able to live under the wickedness that he's brought upon the earth. Now, let's talk about, uh, again, we're talking about nuclear war. This is something that a lot of people are talking about. I'm not overly concerned about it because I don't think it's going to happen on the level like of the earth being destroyed because I think the Lord said that he's not going to let that happen. However, we might see a nuclear exchange. It might happen. I mean, there are crazy. Let me say this. Are you listening? Pull in close. Listen to me real quick. There was a time when only America had a nuclear weapon. It was an atom bomb, so it was really an atomic weapon, whatever. And let's just call it nuclear because that's what we relate to. Only the United States had that. Now, let's just go to the past. Let's say the United States in the arms race did not develop a nuclear weapon first. Let's say Hitler did. Hitler, had he possessed a nuclear or atomic device, would have, in my opinion, used that. If Hitler would have had a nuclear bomb, he'd have used it. There are people who are demonized and crazy enough to do that. I think actually the only reason it hasn't happened is because the Lord, we talk about God just kind of sitting back with his arms folded and letting the world go. I, you know, he does allow us to live the consequences, good and bad of our own behavior. He does. That's necessary so that we can see here's what happens when you do what's right. Here's what happens when you do wrong. It hurts you and it hurts others. It blesses you and it blesses us. So he does allow us to live out the consequences of what we do. However, I think if he did that without any regard, in other words, he never stepped in. How many times has God saved your life? How many times has he saved my life? How many times has the Lord stepped in? And really, really just stepped in and stepped over the top of what you were doing to protect you. I think he's done that with the planet probably many times. And he will do it again in the end. Now, how far will he let that go? I don't know. I know one thing. He said that I will shorten the days because I made a promise that I would never allow that kind of decimation to happen on the earth. Some people believe it'll still happen through nuclear war. I don't think it will. I do um, believe it's possible that we'll have a nuclear exchange. That I do believe, but I do not believe the Lord will allow all flesh, mutual destruction, mad, mutual assured destruction to happen. Now, the reason, think about this, and again, it wasn't my plan to talk about this, but God really laid this heavily on my heart because it's actually in the Bible, okay? The reason that uh, we did not have a nuclear, highlight the word exchange, Okay, it's one thing to drop a nuclear bomb. It's another thing for someone to send another one back to you. That would be an exchange of nuclear bombs. Okay, are you listening to what I'm saying? The only reason we did not have a nuclear exchange 
okay, we sent one to Japan and Japan sent one back is because Japan didn't have one, okay? You understand that. We were the only ones that possessed the capacity to do that. That has radically changed. If Japan would have had a nuclear weapon, I guarantee you, well, probably we would never would have uh, used an atom bomb in the first place. But if we had, they would have absolutely exchanged and said, okay, here, we're returning the favor. Do you get what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to emphasize to you, I Mike, is that humanity possesses the capacity to bring to pass what Jesus said he would not allow to come to pass, at least in the fullest sense. He says, unless those days are shortened, there would no flesh be saved. Not talking about human soul, not talking about salvation, not talking about people being right with God. The same way that all flesh, quote unquote, was destroyed in Genesis. And again, when he says all, he, all but eight, okay, in God's eyes, that's, you know, all. <clears throat> he says that could happen in the end again. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so to be in the coming of the Son of Man. We're on that same trajectory, okay? We're sucking up iniquity, we're doing evil, and we're but there's a whole lot of people doing good. And we don't just have eight people. We got, I don't know, 800 million, I don't know how many we have in the world today that are contemporary Noahs. They are righteous men and women who are serving the Lord. So, okay, so please don't say Jim's saying everybody's wicked and God's going to destroy us all. That's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to get you to see what this thing is going to look like as we transfer from this kingdom into the second kingdom. And again, if you just tuned in, you need to go back and listen to the first part of this. Okay, and all these scriptures are there and I'm going to have to wrap it up. So do you know that the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 5, 5, that the flesh can be destroyed and the spirit saved? There was actually a man who was doing some really ungodly things. You can look it up. And uh, the Bible says, uh, Paul said, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Okay, sometimes the Lord says, you know what? This flesh of yours is going to drop off, but the spirit can be saved. Okay, I don't want to go any more than that. Do know that there is such a thing, First Thessalonians 5.23, your human condition, you, Okay, Elizabeth, Mike, Cheryl, you guys have a spirit and a soul and a body. You are triune as God is triune. One scripture that says this, there's more than one. First Thessalonians 5, 23 says, I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body be sanctified on the day of the Lord. So what's that mean? I can't go into that deep. I've done that before in the past, but let me just reiterate. The spirit is the part that comes from God. The Bible says the, the body goes back to the dust. And, uh, and then it says the spirit goes back to God who gave it. It is the very life force of God in you. You, you are, you have a spirit. Okay. It, and I've used the illustration. If you fall over dead right now, you know, <clears throat> I don't know exactly how it'd go, but we've heard many, many testimonies. I was in the hospital laying on, on the bed and I died and I rose up and I'm, I'm looking at my body down there and I'm going, man, who is that? Or, and, you know, I'm saying, Hey everybody, I'm right here. You know, so your spirit remains period. I don't care if your body disintegrates with an atom bomb, your spirit will be standing there. We're probably heading up to heaven because the Bible says to be absent from the body, which, what is that saying? That's saying you're still there. You're absent from the body. You are still there. That is the spirit. Okay, you get it? You are a spirit person. Okay, so to be absent from the body is what? To go out of existence. No, to be present with the Lord. That means you're still there and you go to be the Lord. All right. Your spirit, your soul, the Bible teaches that it is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's your personality, okay? It's your thinker. It operates through your brain for sure, okay? The mind, will, and emotions. You have a spirit. You have a soul. And I like to say it this way. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. That's how I say it. You can say it your way. I, have a, I am a spirit. I am a spirit. I am not a natural, I'm not an earthly creature having a heavenly experience. I am a heavenly creature having an earthly experience. This is temporary. And when I go, I go back to the God who made me. Or I go to hell and I go to eternity without him. That's my choice. Okay. I am a spirit. I'm eternal in that regard. I have a soul. That's the part of me that differentiates me from everybody else, my personality. And that will be retained in eternity. And then I live in a body. Okay, the body might be destroyed. The body will go back to the dust. It might go, you know, to the worms and the sea. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter because the Bible says he will re, 
construct, reconstitutes your physical DNA and your cells and all of your organs, and he will do that on the resurrection, and you will be raised from the dead regardless of how you perished. Okay? So, no flesh being saved literally means flesh. Okay? It's not saying if the Lord doesn't come, everybody will lose their salvation. Because some people, they fear about that. And it's, I just don't believe it's true. Because there's always been somebody on the earth who's been saved. Well, if the Lord let it go long enough, things will get so bad that nobody be saved. That's not what he's saying. He's saying no flesh. In other words, he's saying you have the capacity to destroy yourself. We had a very limited capacity in the past, and we still almost did it. Now, the earth possesses. You've seen the movies. It's a, That's a real thing. Okay? But the Lord says... I'm not, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. Jesus said, I don't know the day. None of you know the day. Go ahead and strive for it. Go ahead and beat yourself to death. Go ahead and do all your Bible word studies and put it in computers. Just do whatever you want to do. But it remains the same. Jesus, I don't even know, says the Lord, what the day is. And you're never going to know. So I want you to live like you should be ready all the time. That's why he did it. That's why the Father did it. Only the Father knows. Okay? Not even the Son. All right. That day and that hour knoweth no man. That's Matthew 24, verse 36. All these verses are on there. I didn't actually get to print the verse out, but the reference points so you can look them up. I encourage you to look them up. This, listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. You are responsible. You live in this day. God didn't, it wasn't accidental that you were put in this, on this planet during this season right prior to the coming of the Lord. You have a responsibility to know the way things are going to play out so that you can live right. And I'm not just talking about getting uber crazy about, some people do this with the end, you know, they get in this or they get in some other doctrine and just, uh, they get obsessed with it and it becomes their whole life. And don't do that. <clears throat> don't lose your functionality on the planet because you're trying to understand what the planet's going to go through. Okay, give a reasonable amount of time to it. You know, submit it to the Lord. Understand that you don't have to know everything, but you do have to know that this thing is winding up and it's winding down. And we're coming to the place where the Lord says, I'm going to return. Now, just for extra credit, Second Peter 3.10, okay? I'm wrinkling, I'm throwing away my paper. Second Peter 3.10 does talk about the earth being melt, uh, melted with fervent heat. Many people have said that's a nuclear holocaust. That's the apocalypse. That's the Terminator. That's Judgment Day. All of that. I don't believe it is, and I'll tell you why. Because I think if the Lord says, I'm not going... Now, listen, listen close. If the Lord says, I'm going to shorten those days so that you don't destroy yourself, and then, because really that, that melting with a fervent heat, that doesn't happen until the Lord is, in my opinion, my belief, been on the earth for about a thousand years okay he will renovate the earth with fire okay there will come a day when he will renovate he says behold i'll make all things new nothing will even come into your memory okay it's it is too much for me to talk about but basically people say oh no we're get taken in the rapture and then the lord renovates the earth with fire really so he renovates the earth with fire in order to re constitute the earth to look like the Garden of Eden again. That's the whole point of it. He doesn't renovate it with fire and scorch the elements. And the Bible is very specific. It says this specifically and in more than one place that the heavens being on fire and the earth being on fire will be completely, it'll be scorched earth. It'll be like, like it was, listen now, before, I, I don't mean to say that all the time. Listen now, listen now. Okay. I just want you to pay attention. That's a preacher in me. Okay. The earth will actually go back to the way it was before. Darkness covered the earth. What does it say? The earth was without form and void and darkness covered. In other words, just a husk. Just a core, just a, just a planet with nothing on it. God is going to return it, if I read the scripture correctly, back to that original position so that he can then go ahead with the partnership of man, the new man, Adam, and all of his children, that's Jesus and us, He'll remake the earth as it was like in the Garden of Eden, even better. Okay. Now, if he does that at the rapture of the church, so he, he either remakes the earth, but then the Bible says a thousand years, and then, then the armies of the enemy are loosed out of the pit, and they all come against 
Jerusalem and God's got to wipe them all out again. So it doesn't make sense that he would go back to the beginning only to let mankind mess it up again. So my belief is, and we're certainly not coming back to a big burnt over husk of the earth. My belief is we're going to, will be the dead in Christ will rise. That's first resurrection. Jesus will come. I'm skipping a lot of points. Thousand year millennium. He will physically be seen by human beings on the earth. He will live in Jerusalem. He will sit on a throne, yada, yada, yada. And then when the end comes and the armies of, of uh, hell, the, the bottom of the spit is opened up, the armies of hell gathers. He says he gathers an army as the multitude of the sands of the sea. It's hard to believe that people who saw Jesus alive on the earth for a thousand years still rebel against him. I believe one of the reasons the Lord does this is because people have this thing in their head that says, well, Jesus, if you would have just stayed on the earth, we think we're smarter than God. If you would have just stayed on the earth, you know, resurrect from the dead, don't go back to heaven, okay? Create a question mark in everybody's mind. You ever thought about this? If Jesus, if you'd only just stayed on the earth, you know, how can people deny a man that's 2,000 years old? Well, let me tell you this, we'd figure out a way. <laughs> We always figure out a way. So the Lord does both. He says, I'm going to go back. I'm going to let you uh, live by faith. I'm going to, you know, blessed are those whom having not seen believe. I'm going to let you multiply many, many Christians on the earth. And he says, then just in order to answer your debate that if I had to be alive on the earth, everybody would be saved. I'll go ahead and come back to the earth and I'll be alive for a thousand years on the earth. And still at the end of the thousand years, the Bible specifically says the pit where Satan is and Satan's bound up too. I mean, it's the best of the best, right? Jesus is on the earth and the devil is in hell. Well, not hell technically, but the Bible says he's in the bottomless pit, Tartarus, the abyss. And he's there with the fallen angels for 1,000 years. There's no devil on the earth. The devil made me do it. No, devil's, devil's bound. He's gone. So we have Jesus on the earth and the devil is gone. And everything is as it could possibly be good. And yet at the end of that, when Satan is loosed out of the bottomless pit, it says he gathers the armies of darkness. He get, Not only the fallen angels, but people, people who have lived to see Jesus. So the Lord says, okay, I'll take that challenge. I've been alive for a thousand years and still they're going to turn. So big overview. I know I've given you a lot. Didn't even intend to do a lot, but here's the point. God says, I'm never going to allow the earth to be wiped out like that again. We now have the capacity to do that. And uh, the Lord says, even though we may see nuclear exchange, I have some very well-respected people that I know that uh, that believe that the Lord has actually, as a matter of fact, I think one of them, the Lord says, or the, they say the Lord appeared to them. I don't know. It doesn't matter that there will be limited nuclear exchange in various countries, <clears throat> but not mutually, not mutual destruction. And I believe that's not because we don't have the capacity or there are enough insane people like Adolf Hitler. See, Adolf Hitler was like the almost Antichrist. There was actually a book called The Almost Antichrist. And he was occult driven and he was demon possessed and he did every evil thing you can imagine. And I believe if he would have had, I believe the only reason he did not decimate the earth and bring the earth under his subjection is because he did not possess a nuclear power. There was no one that had that at the time. They were shooting for it, and they have it now. Germany has it now, and I don't condemn that nation. But you get what I'm saying? Okay? God prevented that madman, that almost Antichrist, you know, who was slaughtering Jews, and you just you name it, the, uh, the terrific, horrendous thing. God kept him from doing it. And he allowed the United States to get there first. And I'm not saying God did that, but all right, I got to stop, because I can just keep going and going and going. Here's the point. Here's the day you're living in. Live like God wants you to live. Abandon unrighteousness. Cease your drunkenness. Cease your addictions. Cease your pornography. Cease your adultery. Cease your lying. Stop those things that God said that there is no liar or fornicator or drunkard or perjurer or whatever shall enter the kingdom of heaven. He said nobody that practices those things are going to go to heaven. It is time, my friend, 
to wipe the slate clean. It is time to embrace righteousness. It is time to allow the great gift of heaven, the loving Jesus to come and wash your past away and let you start a new life today. Okay, you don't want to be caught unawares. You don't want the Lord to return when you're in the midst of debauchery. You want to live for him and he loves you and he's done everything to show you that he loves you. All right, man. All right. God bless you. Thanks for listening today. Again, I uh, I know this was uh, this was unplanned. I said I wasn't going to do it, and uh, things changed for me, so here I am. So God bless you guys. Thanks for listening. Sandy, how are you? Good to see you. And uh, love you guys. Lord, I pray that you bless your people today. Encourage their hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I got to go to work. Love you all. Give yourself permission to have a great day and share this with somebody who's concerned about the days they live in. God bless.